Hey, uh, thank you very much, Christina. It's great to be here today. Um, and I'm really excited to be uh, talking with you along with Chris Bradford. And uh, our goal for today is um, light on slides, heavy on demos, if I'm right. So uh, we'll see how we do with that. And we're gonna be talking about unboxing Kate Sandra, the data layer for your Kubernetes powered applications. Um, so first of all, we wanna start out from the very beginning. What is Kate Sandra? And before I, before I uh, kick Chris off on that, I'm gonna have you take a look at the logo and see if you can uh, kind of guess here. You see a little bit of the nautical element with the sextant, right? And then there is this uh, star here um, and there, there's a little bit of a clue there. So, but why don't you unpack it a little bit for us, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So yeah, so Kate Sandra is a bit of a mashup here we have Kubernetes, right? As well as Cassandra or Apache Cassandra. And we're gonna talk about running Cassandra on Kubernetes, but also some of the pieces that enable you to run a production-like system uh, on, on, on Kubernetes. So specifically, not just the database. I think uh, it's, it's pretty easy to just spin up a pod or a container, and in the case of Cassandra, a, a few of those, um, but also the supporting technologies that surround it. Cool. Yeah, well, let's, so, I mean, we do got to start with the foundation of this, and we've already tipped our hat that it's uh, Cassandra on Kubernetes is the basis of this. So, uh, you know, we're going to assume some familiarity with Kubernetes here, but we want to, we want to kind of mention why, like, what is, what is the problem that Kubernetes really solves, and, and why did it win? It was competing with other uh, orchestration systems for containers, right? So, um there's some aspects of this that I think that uh, will we'll make it a natural to go with Cassandra, but let's unpack that for a second. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the things that we want to look at specifically is, is what is what is what is Kubernetes solving, right? Uh, it's really a platform for deploying a number of containers across a fleet of servers. Uh, I've heard it described as the operating system of the data center, and I think that's a pretty apt description. Uh, when we talk about a system like Cassandra, which we'll do here in a second, uh, it runs across multiple servers already. And so it's interesting to see how multiple distributed systems kind of come together, coalesce into a scalable, self-healing, um, if things are configured correctly, uh, platform for deploying your applications. And I, I like to think of it as removing a lot of the tedium uh, from the work that I used to do in, in the NOC or on individual machines. Awesome. All right, and that brings so, us to Cassandra. <laughs> so Apache Cassandra is has a lot of similarities to Kubernetes in, in that it's a distributed system, right? Um, and so at the surface, at the high level, we have these common terminology uh, that are common to both as distributed systems of nodes and nodes that are formed into clusters. Um, but then there is a point at which the similarities stop and there are a, a few differences. So the mapping maybe appears really easy at a high level, but then at, at the lower level, there are some details uh, that we need to work out. And we will kind of talk through that later on in the presentation, but let's go, let's, let's step back and say like, why Cassandra? Like what makes Cassandra a, a great solution for cloud native architectures. Sure. So one of the things that I think Cassandra has done really well is it's it's a peer to peer database. It, there's no leader and follower. There's no concept of uh, like a, a write replica and then read replicas. Uh, any node can answer any query, and it will route that to the appropriate actual instance that hosts the data. Um, so it's it's a really interesting fit here when we look at, at a system like Kubernetes, where traditionally it was really solid for stateful workloads, or sorry, stateless workloads. Those are pretty easy to scale. You just spin up more of them and make sure they're added to your load balancer and away you go, right? Uh, but when we look at stateful services like Cassandra or really any database, uh, things get a little bit trickier. You can't just add a new node and expect it to be fully functional right away. What if a read request goes to that node? Well, it doesn't have any data when it first starts. Uh, so there's this process that you have to, to go through to make sure, okay, this is ready to start accepting traffic, or um, if a node goes down and comes back up, is there data there to operate on, or does it need to bootstrap off of other nodes in the cluster? Uh, so it's 
because Andrew's a really interesting fit because it, it does some of those things out of the box. And what I like about it, at least in the realm of Kubernetes and, and data on Kubernetes, is that it kind of aligns with the expectations of Kubernetes, uh, that, that Kubernetes has of, it, of its containers um, and brings a lot of the behavior of the, the, the state list where you can scale out uh, pretty easily, right? And you have high availability, your self-healing of no goes down, it can come back up. Uh, that you would get with your stateless workloads, you get that with your your stateful workload with, with Cassandra. Uh, but do you want to, Jeff? Do you want to go into a little bit about Cassandra? You have a, a experience here. You've written a book on the, on the topic. Um, well, that is true. I mean, I, I have a, um, written a book on Cassandra. Uh, one of the things that it, I found interesting over the past few years, I've actually done two editions. The Cassandra book for O'Reilly, and um, this I, I did the second edition and the third edition. And when about uh, five years ago, when I was writing the second edition, uh, it was very it was clear that I needed to add a section on running um, Cassandra in containers in Docker. And I, I ended up putting a um, a note in that was basically like, yeah, you should totally try this out and use it in your dev environment, but it, I, I wouldn't recommend it in prod. So that was kind of like the <laughs> my word of record for three years until I did the third edition of the book. And by then the landscape had completely changed. And, you know, I was like, yes, you could deploy Cassandra in containers and it's going to work fine. And then it was kind of like, and this area of deploying in Kubernetes and managing with Kubernetes is emerging. So, and again, it's probably almost a year and a half since I wrote that. Um, so now we're, we're in a very different landscape here. Um, and I think you've had kind of a, 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 what do I call it, a conversion experience of your own? I mean, we had a blog that just went live yesterday where you kind of shared your story, but why don't you nutshell that for us? Yeah, it's, it's actually really fascinating. Uh, just at a high level, if you asked me uh, just a number of years ago, probably about two, whether you should be running databases on Kubernetes, I would have been like, uh, no, no, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> and it's been right. interesting to see like how Kubernetes has grown to accommodate stateful workloads from the primitives with persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, stateful sets, uh, and, and, and then starting to leverage those from the database side to say, okay, this is, this is a little bit more reasonable. Uh, so we'll, we'll get that, uh, that link out in, in the chat here in a moment. So y'all can take a look at that. I don't want to go too deep into uh, right, the right. conversation and there, but I, I was a former skeptic and now wholeheartedly embrace uh, the data on Kubernetes uh, approach. Absolutely. Good. And I think that, that um, to the point, we have a question from John Doe. <laughs> and I don't know, John Doe, John Smith, uh, anonymous friend that uh, is asking if we're, if we have anybody using Keith Sander and prod yet. And you want to talk to that a little bit? Like, I think we have different piece, pieces of the Kate Sander ecosystem that are in various stages of adoption, as well as kind of a whole assemblage that we're about to unbox for you. So, yeah, I think it's it's important to note. So when we started with with our journey into Cassandra and Kubernetes, we started with an operator, uh, and we'll talk about all the other operators here in a second. But we started with just an operator, uh, and that's grown to uh, containerizing and productionizing multiple components that make up a, a cohesive stack or platform. And that's what Kate Sandra is. It's the collection of all these technologies uh, to run a production ready workload. So there are people that are running Cassandra on Kubernetes today in production uh, with CAS operator uh, and, and some of the other technologies. Uh, as far as the packaging of it all under one name, uh, that's something that's, that's uh, currently in flight. But great question. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a relatively new. We had a 1.0 release uh, a couple months back and we're dropping a 1.0 release this week with some uh, enhancements that maybe we can talk about in, in line here as we get to it in the presentation. But, uh, you know, one of the things as we talk about unboxing, right, and looking at what's inside this Kate Sander distribution, um, one of the architectural goals that we had was composability. So we are saying when, when you get a release of Kate Sandra that we're saying this is a blessed configuration that we know and we're confident saying this all works together and is packed, packaged together well. And yes, you can customize it and swap other pieces in and out. So uh, I feel like we've been teasing the unboxing part for too long now though. Yeah, so let's, 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 let's push on. <laughs> let's dig into it. So the, the first component to really look into 
is is monitoring any production system well any system that i want to ship to production maybe it doesn't always happen but i, I try to make it happen should have observability for monitoring uh, and so kate sandra uh, has taken the q prometheus stack uh, helm chart and and brought it in uh, but we we actually handle all the wiring uh, of Prometheus and the, the running Cassandra cluster. So uh, the Kate Sandra distribution makes sure that we enables the uh, metrics collector for Apache Cassandra in, inside of each of the containers. Uh, and then it spins up the service monitors and the dashboards to actually wire this in to Prometheus and Grafana running inside of your, your Kubernetes infrastructure. Now, uh, you might already have that in your infrastructure. We're seeing a number of uh, vendor-backed Kubernetes distros actually already shipped yeah. this pre-installed it's centralized it, centralized monitoring is, is something that you would see uh, and under the, the the banner of composability you can just turn this off like you can say i already have my own prometheus i already have my own grafana just don't bother with that but we have the hooks in place that if you do want kitsander to still push out the service monitors which uh provide the 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 plumbing between uh, prometheus's scrape targets and the actual nodes we can still provision this for you without setting up an entire stack. Right, and that's a that's a really nice uh, and flexible configuration. It, one of the things that I love about uh, Grafana, you know, as a as a platform for uh, graphical and, and Prometheus as well, is that, you know the fact that um, I can build a complete observability solution for my application all the way down the stack. Right, so I can have. Uh, uh, graphs that are showing the workload uh, that's coming in on my microservices and my application tier, but also put that alongside graphs that are showing what's happening with the underlying Cassandra database. And I can, you know, compose my own dashboard that really kind of gives me a top to bottom picture, which I think is just amazing. Yeah, I love the the composition of looking at your application metrics and looking at, looking at your database metrics. Okay, where exactly is this going sideways? Uh, can really give you the whole picture. Um, it, I think it's worth right. noting, though. It, some yeah. some people might say, "Well, what if I don't use uh, Prometheus?" What What do you think about that, uh, Jeff? Uh, well, as, as we've been talking about the uh, you know that that format of the Prometheus, the way that it represents metrics is becoming some of somewhat of a de facto standard, and so we're seeing a lot of other monitoring stacks provide compatibility with that. So. I think so that's our you, that's our short term answer for that, right? Yeah, even if you don't use Prometheus, a, a number of like the monitoring solutions out there can still scrape those those metrics and and ingest them into their systems. So, so. All right. So monitoring, knowing what's going on is one thing, but there's some definitely some operational tasks that um, Kubernetes itself isn't going to magically just do for you. So I feel like we should talk about some of those. Yeah, and I think one of the, the key things that comes to my mind is, well, what happens if, uh, so monitoring is great, but all of a sudden I just don't have notes. What do we do then? <laughs> uh, there, there, there's a, a stray command pointed at the wrong namespace, and now I don't have my cluster. What, what can I do? And it's not just human error too, right? I mean, we have worker nodes that can fail in a Kubernetes cluster, and it's designed around that. But sure. and now what if those nodes had data? <laughs> Yeah, that, and that's that's where the stateful conversation gets interesting, right? And so, we've we've taken the uh, the Medusa project uh, out of the last pickle, and I think it. I'm trying to remember if that came out of Spotify or if that was the repair system, but in any case, uh, it, it it powers backups via K Kubernetes custom resources to a object store. So you can instead of having to can I orchestrate this by hand? You just say, hey, I want a Cassandra backup. And it says, all right, it will reach out to all the nodes, trigger the backup operation, snapshots the, the data files, and then ships those off to a, an S3 compatible object store. Um, so, and that's part of the, the next release that Jeff hinted at earlier is uh, compatibility with MinIO and uh, as, as, as an, example, an example S3 compatible store. Yeah, but what, what do you think some of the other use cases are for this kind of uh, backup and restore functionality, Jeff? Um, yeah, we're starting to see a lot of interest in uh, incorporating uh, backup and restore as a, a tool for building CI/CD pipelines. So, in other words, I want to spin up uh, 
you know, uh, an instance of my application stack in order to run uh, integration tests against it, let's say, and we want to, as part of that, to have the database there as well. Uh, but maybe I want to have an initial state that's represented in the database. So I can actually use, it's pretty handy to be able to uh, restore a data set and then uh, rather than having to do like a bunch of data loading tasks or, or run Kubernetes jobs to do that, you can actually just uh, do a restore. And you again, because there is an API for this in Medusa, you can easily uh, you know just hit that API, do the restore, and, and script that as as part of your pipeline. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's all done with kubectl too. So there's no extra uh, CLI or any any interfaces that you have to access. It's, it's a custom resource inside of your, your environment. That's a, that's yeah, a great example. You're, you're using uh, uh, Cassandra-friendly terminology and abstractions that are built on top of uh, Kubernetes at that point. So one of the interesting things about a distributed system, though, is is not is uh, that data can sometimes get out of sync. And we, we do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And Cassandra has been around for, I think it's north of 10 years now. Uh, and so there is, we, we call it repair I like to refer to it as anti-entropy. Things are going to get out of sync, though, whether that's uh, maybe a GC ran too long and it missed a write, or the uh, node was just down when a write came in. Um, and, and like I said, there's a layered approach to resolving these issues. Um, but it, I think it's worth noting that there's one that's called uh, the out-of-band repair process. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, a process called Reaper, which uh, handles calling the API endpoints to trigger these repair processes. We have a best practice where you want to do this every 10 days across your entire cluster. So you do a full repair. Um, and again, ideally, it's it's very minor repairs that need to happen. Um, and, and there are other systems in place to assist with this. Uh, but what this tool does is instead of you as an operator having to log into each server and say, all right, server A, it's your turn today, running the repair command, this actually breaks it up into smaller chunks and runs it over, over that entire 10-day uh, period. Uh, right, yeah, this is one of those uh, things that's, you know, one of those fine print kinds of things that a lot of people forget to do, uh, you know, in order to maintain the health of their system until uh, all of a sudden they realize that it's a problem. Um, so it's not that big of a deal if you start doing it from day one, but then if you, you know, if you don't follow the proper operational procedures and, and ignore it, then that you're not in a good situation either. Yeah, and, and for what it's worth, I, I, I like the phrase, always be repairing. And even when you're doing your capacity planning, you should make sure you have repairs turned on and running uh, so you can account for that operational overhead when you're trying to figure out how many nodes you need for your cluster. Yes, yes, of course. So we, we mentioned here a second ago, uh, taking this away from the, the human operator, operator is kind of an overloaded term in, in, in Kubernetes land, um, taking away from the, the human right. operators with the DBAs, right? And instead of having them run this, uh, we have a, a helpful tool here, but when we talk about running a distributed system, it can be tricky and automation helps with that significantly. I mean, I've, I've seen clusters that had hundreds of nodes uh, that were all configured by hand. Uh, we very quickly moved over to an automation tool. I think that particular case was Ansible. Mm -hmm. And it was helpful, right? You could still log in and say, okay, I want to deploy Cassandra to all of these servers. And it would go through to each one, install the packages, and start it up and, and rinse and repeat throughout the rest of the cluster. But I tell you what, when you get into hundreds of nodes, that can take hours, it can take a lot of time. Uh, and so one of the things that, that we've created, uh, and we mentioned it earlier, was, was CAS operators. So it's a Cassandra operator. And it does a really good job of, of translating these like logical concepts of a Cassandra data center and Cassandra racks and, and the size of a cluster and the topology and all this into Kubernetes resources. So it'll say, okay, I know that a logical rack inside of Cassandra is equal to a Kubernetes stable set. Yeah. If you describe that rack to me, I will, I being CAS operator, will go ahead and, and say, hey, Kubernetes API, can you make a stable set for me? Uh, and just like we mentioned with with repairs and with uh, with backups, um, there are other operators as well. So the Medusa operator, the, Premier, uh, the Reaper operator, handle that translation for you. Uh, but there are also Kubernetes controllers. They do reconciliation. So in the case of a pod going down uh, for for Cassandra, Kubernetes will restart the pod right and, and try to bring it back online. But uh, in 
the complexity of running a distributed system, maybe we want to restart pods in a certain order. Uh, one of the common operations is a rolling restart of a Cassandra cluster. And so you can just, in your custom resource, say, I want you to restart. And the operator will handle uh, terminating pods, letting them come back up uh, in a rolling fashion to let the cluster work, performing upgrades, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a, the upgrade case. I think is super interesting. I mean, basically, it's a it's an instance of a rolling restart with a a little twist. Yeah, we're just going to change the binaries on you. Uh, but I feel I, like we've things... been given too, we've given a lot of love to the operations side here, Chris. I don't know. You should finish yeah, your fair. point, but I want to talk about devs too. Oh yeah, sure. I think one <laughs> of the things that that is worth calling out though is. And when you go to do something like a like an upgrade, you want to make sure that everything isn't just going to go sideways. I would I would hate to say, okay, switch out all the binaries and for the cluster to not come back up. Uh, so one of the key features that we really don't uh, talk about too much is that we allow for canary upgrades, so we can target a single node or a, a selection of nodes to upgrade before moving on to the the rest of the cluster as a whole. But to your point, Jeff, I do think we need to switch gears and start talking about how the heck do we actually talk to the system instead of just running it. Well, that's right. I mean, if we have a perfectly running database that uh, no one's putting data in or getting data out, I don't know that's much use. So now traditionally in, uh, in a Cassandra database, we have the Cassandra query language um, that's very similar to, you know, classic SQL that, that we're using. Um, one of the things that we've found is uh, that a lot of companies have uh, begun building out their own API layers on top of Cassandra and not necessarily letting every application developer just write raw CQL queries. Uh, true? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the, the purpose of this Stargate project that we've started, this is another open source project that's kind of a, you know, a companion or, or uh, fits nicely with Kate Sandra. Um, and we've incorporated uh, starting in the Kate Sandra. So it is CQL compatible access to Cassandra, but also provides REST, GraphQL, and document APIs. So the idea is, you know, no matter what flavor of API you're most comfortable with interacting with as a developer, that's, that's something that's available to you. Yeah, and you might have an existing application that already speaks CQL, uh, but one of the things that can be tricky, at least it was for me when I first started running Cassandra, um, back in 2013, I went to Cassandra Summit because a buddy had an extra ticket. And I spent the, the, the second day just trying to use Cassandra and being so angry because I was like, this looks just like SQL. And it's not. There are certain things you're not allowed to do because it's a distributed system, uh, which yeah. is fascinating. Yeah. But I, I tell you what, if I had a REST interface or a document interface, I would have been able to go a lot further that day. <laughs> Uh, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, Jeff, do you want to dig in a little bit into kind of the the, the interfaces that are? Sure. I mean, and this this slide can you know appear pretty busy. Um, I, I'd encourage you to look at it in two halves: the top half and the bottom half. So the idea is that Stargate is an extensible architecture. You can add in new APIs. So existing right now are REST, GraphQL, and Document API, and of course the Cassandra Query language. Uh, there's a, a Kafka integration in progress, uh, Pulsar integration on the roadmap. And then on the back end, uh, it's also designed so that you can plug in uh, a compatible data store. So right now, the, the ones that we have to date are Cassandra compatible databases. Um, so open source Cassandra 3.1, 3.11, um, the 4.0 release, which Cassandra 4.0 is about to go live here imminently. There's a release candidate out there, right? And uh, yeah. So we'll we'll be upgrading Kate Sandra as just as soon as that uh, goes live, um, so that Kate Sandra would ship with the official Cassandra four Oh, uh, and then of course the data sacks, the, the enterprise distribution as well, uh, fits. Uh, but the idea is that you could plug this in, you uh, you could do the work and want to if you wanted to plug in a different database base engine on the back end. So very composable. That's the architectural principle that's at work here. One of the fascinating things I think is kind of interesting here, we've, we've done some testing in this space, is that you can use Stargate almost as a, uh, if you think about the traditional separation of compute and storage that people talk about inside their data centers, you can do something yeah. similar here with, with, with Stargate. It's, it is a stateless layer in front of your, your, your backend database. So if you have a large number of clients, um, rather than having the actual nodes that hold the data handle like switching context and things like that, um, you can scale that layer independently of your data layer. We've seen yeah. some reductions in latency 
while reducing the total number of nodes in the cluster, which is kind of fascinating. This is especially great for read heavy workloads. So, so let's look at what it takes to actually in install uh, Aunt Kate Sandra and, and actually fire it up inside of your, your Kubernetes environment. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You add the Helm repo for Kate Sandra. Uh, you update your repo to make sure you have the latest version of the chart. And then you just install it. Um, and given that we have a Helm install command here, I think it's probably a good time to, to transition and actually showing you what this looks Why like. Why don't you so, just show us? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've actually run the, that same command here inside of my terminal. Um, we're just doing a Helm install. Here, I'm overriding a couple of values that are unique just to my machine. It's nothing crazy. I just told it to use a specific storage class inside of my Kubernetes cluster called local path. And the data volume I want to use is, is, is one gigabyte in size. Um, when this, this takes about two minutes per node to, to, to spin up, but rather than waste your time here, I've already run it. So let's go over here to lens though, mm -hmm. and try and make this, uh, I cannot make that a little bit bigger. That's okay. We, and let's take a look at, at the components here that, that have been deployed. So if I go back and I look at my, my custom resources, um, we can see there is a Cassandra data center that's been provisioned called DC1. Um, and if we go and actually look at it, um, there's there's a bit more here. So this is all templated out with Helm. Uh, managed fields tends to be a bit verbose. But you can see we've configured uh, password authentication. Um, we've set uh, the number of replicas. This is a single node installation because I'm running here on my laptop. Um, but if you're in uh, a larger environment, let's say you have a three node cluster, you, we could set the replication factor to three. Um, we describe. Uh, in this case, we have ways to override certain um, pieces inside of the Cassandra data center. Uh, so in this case, we're configuring Reaper. We mentioned that part of Kate Sandra is we wanted to have a cohesive platform. Uh, and so we, we handle setting up things like init containers for you uh, instead of having to roll that yourself. Uh, but let's say you have a, a special system for handling secrets or for SSL certificates. You can actually add your own init container in here to request those uh, certificates and, and add them to configuration. So this is here, uh, secure by default. I think that's uh, an important thing to note is that when we deploy Cassandra in, in Kubernetes here, I mean, it's uh, it's not just wide open access, right? Yeah, and for what it's worth, I don't know the credentials yet. We're going to find those out here in a second <laughs> for how to, right. how to connect to the cluster. <laughs> cool. Uh, but we can see we have a helpful status as well. I believe we just added to the docs this really nice one-liner where you can just say, hey, I want you to wait until the Kubernetes, until the Cassandra cluster is up and running. Um, but let's go back to our pods view and take a look at, at what's going on here. So here we can see uh, a number of components. First, we have the actual CAS operator that we mentioned before. There's the operator for Prometheus, Reaper, and uh, Medusa is not enabled on this particular instance. Uh, but if we had enabled Medusa, we'd see the Medusa operator running as well. There's a job that ran to configure the schema for Reaper, which just is for tracking the progress of the repairs. Um, we can see our Grafana. And then these two are the really important ones, uh, in my opinion. We have our Stargate pod, so a single Stargate instance, as well as, as the uh, Cassandra pod. And what's fascinating here is we mentioned a little bit earlier that Cassandra racks are analogous to stateful sets. And right. so when we, when we talk about like the topology of, of a Cassandra cluster, what, what, what's the purpose of a rack here, Jeff? Can you go into that a little bit? Sure. I mean, in Cassandra, we use racks because we want to uh, achieve high availability of our data by using replication. So the idea is that a rack is a representation of kind of like a physical server or a failure domain such that uh, you know, if we have a, a piece of physical equipment that's running our, our, our a node in our Cassandra cluster that goes down, we don't want all of our Cassandra nodes to be you know, on that piece of hardware that goes down. We want to have some distribution of Cassandra nodes that are on, running on different hardware. So the, these concepts that are built into Cassandra's terminology like data center and rack are used uh, to manage the topology of the cluster such that the different copies of, of each piece of data that are stored are actually spread out across multiple failure domains. So if I was looking at a cloud environment, would it be safe to say that a rack is like a, an AZ and a data center is more analogous to like a, a, a region? That's the, I, I would say that that's the kind of the default assumption. I think, you know, if you want to have additional logical data centers for different reasons, like you want to offload some 
uh, read heavy workloads or something. People do do that, but I think the the layout that you described is kind of a good default. Okay, so looking a bit more at the at an instance of a Cassandra pod, or which is the same as a Cassandra node, uh, we see a number of containers. First, there's this init container called server config init, and what this does is actually takes a JSON structure of the configuration, and this matches the uh, the config block that we see here in the Cassandra DC uh, custom resource. And it actually takes that and it renders that, that into a, a suite of configuration files uh, that, that you would see traditionally under like Etsy Cassandra on, on your uh, virtual machine installations. So this applies a number of, of defaults, but for the most part, this is, this is what's used to actually build the configuration of an individual pod. Um, JMX credentials just sets up uh, uh, the Reaper and super user JMX credentials. Um, now we get to the interesting containers. So those were init containers, the actual running containers. The first is Cassandra. So this is the actual Cassandra process. Um, we can see it has a number of, of ports exposed, including those for Prometheus, uh, the management API, which is uh, used by the Cassandra operator for certain tasks. Um, one of the things that's interesting when we think about multiple distributed systems growing up kind of in the same time, we mentioned that Cassandra is uh, going on 10 years old or might mm. already be 10 years old. Oh yeah, and, it's over, man. It's like 12 or 13. Oh my goodness, I'm so out of date here. <laughs> and and Kubernetes, uh, which is what five going on six years old, uh, they've kind of, you see a bunch of similarities between the components, but where some other items have diverged. So one of the things that's, that's interesting about Cassandra is when you go to start nodes of the cluster, you want to start them in a particular order. Uh, and with with Kubernetes, you can sort of do that. But what we do instead is we schedule all the pods, all the pods start, but they're just running this management API. And then once we see that all the pods are running and they're ready to start, then the Cassandra operator actually reaches out over this, this secure interface and says, hey, right. go ahead and start your Cassandra process. It's just a way to orchestrate uh, some of the differences between how, how these two technologies have, have evolved. And, and like I said, they're similar, but sometimes they're a little different. There's that little bit of scaffolding you need because you know in, in in Kubernetes it wants to treat every pod the same you know that's of a a, a given image uh, in Cassandra we know that you know it is a um, it is a peer to peer architecture where there is no one node that's calling all the shots but it, it, that doesn't mean that there isn't some sort of coordination you know there is there is that communication uh, that nodes kind of need to negotiate with each other as they come up so. Um, that is, you know, that's a little bit of that behind the scenes scaffolding that it really takes to operate Cassandra effectively in Kubernetes. But for what it's worth, based on like what I mentioned before, starting up hundreds of nodes could take hours, right? Uh, yeah. Doing a rolling restart could take hours. The nice thing about the operator here is you say, hey, I want you to start the cluster. You can go get a coffee, right? You don't have to check to see if like certain hosts were skipped because something bad happened. You, That's right. You can just come back and and your cluster is either running or it's it's reconciling and working to make your cluster run. Um, and like I said, if you have a local registry, the start time per pod is a couple of minutes, um, and it's it's really refreshing to have something else handle all that work for you mm -hmm. instead of instead of having to to babysit an SSH terminal. Um, That's right. So looking back here, though, we have another container here called the Server System Logger, and this is just. Uh, we mentioned the, the management API. We wanted to make sure that there were two log streams, so you could still use kubectl logs. The server system logger is actually the output of the main Cassandra process, and the output of the Cassandra uh, container is the management API process. So you can uh, look at those separate log streams uh, individually. The number cool. of volumes, we really don't need to go into that, but uh, we can see we have a running node, we have a running Stargate, everything's green across the board. So let's take a look at how we actually talk to this. I think this is Pretty interesting. So if we go over here to the network and we look at, at services, well, there's a whole suite of services, whether you're looking at the, the monitoring interface, which we will take a look at here in a second, or uh, the, the uh, Reaper UI. I do want to call out that there are a number of, of headless services that represent your Cassandra cluster. So your application would point at maybe the DC1 service, where your monitoring might point at the all pod service, because that one shows pods that aren't up yet. Uh, but there are a number of endpoints. There's also the Stargate service, which is where I would point my applications. Uh, and now right. finally, we want to get into the actual um, secrets. So this is how we actually we we communicate with the uh, 
the cluster. So let's take a look at the super user. So uh, Kate Sandra has created our uh, our cluster. It's also created our user account. So here the name username is Kate Sandra super user, and this is just a random string. Um, you can create the secret yourself and use predefined credentials. Um, but just for this, the sake of the demo here, we went with the default, which is just hey, make it for me. So let's go and kind of explore the interfaces a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go back over here. So I want to connect first to our monitoring system. So we go to services, and if we go to Kate Sandra Grafana, I should just be able to click this, and there we go. Yeah. And now I'm now taken to our. Did you port our, forward our, that to expose? How did you get that access so quickly? Oh, Lens is awesome. So the Kubernetes Lens tool, if you click on the port, will set up the port forwarding for you. Um, awesome. So if I'm not mistaken, it's admin secret. Uh, no, no, go away. All these plugins are now like, we want to save your password. <laughs> so you're going to see, this says that there's nothing here. It's misleading. Um, the dashboards are already installed. Here we go. And we can see we have uh, four pre-installed for you. If we go to Cassandra Overview, um, our cluster is up and running. We can see the status of our node. Um, we'll run some queries against it here in a second. Um, but we, again, you didn't have, I didn't have to do anything here to, to set this up. Uh, all the automations spun this up for me. The really interesting thing is if I change the number of nodes, say from one node to three, they'll automatically get added to our, the monitoring system for us. And that's not, that's like another item in the checklist that I didn't accidentally forget to do again. Uh, right. this, is, this is just handled for you, uh, which is uh, refreshing. Uh, and so besides just Cassandra, we also have a, a Stargate, a separate Stargate um, dashboard, a condensed dashboard. And it, if your application is using uh, metrics, you, or if you're using centralized logging, um, you can pull all this into your own uh, structure. Uh, so that's the monitoring interface. I do want to just mention that uh, um, Prometheus, one of the one of the health checks that I like to do to make sure that my cluster is healthy is I'll go and I'll look at the targets and make sure that A, that they exist here, um, and B, that we're seeing all the labels come in. So you, again, you can see uh, that Prometheus is, is scraping the metrics uh, from both my Stargate node and my, uh, my Cassandra node. That's a okay. great tip. Yeah, if something isn't showing up in here, I always go look at Prometheus first. Uh, sure. I've, I've, I've gotten into plenty of, of edge cases where things just have kind of gone sideways. But let's talk about, let's see, where are we on time? I want to make sure I don't. Well, we got about 10 minutes left for the main, the main piece. Um, I wanted to interject a quick question about where you're running this as you kind of transition here. Is this on your desktop or are you running in a cloud? Does it matter? Uh, it doesn't matter. I've, we've, we test and run on a number of Kubernetes versions. Uh, the, in my case, I'm running on K3D uh, on my local laptop. So I'm running a, a, a single a single node with, with a load balancer as part of K3D. Uh, we test in kind with our integration tests. And as yeah. part of uh, the current build out, we're building out a whole suite of integration tests that target the major cloud uh, Kubernetes vendors. Um, but you, if we go to the project, you can see uh, yeah, we support a, a number of Kubernetes versions and test against those. This is where I think the composability of this is really helpful because I I also mostly run um, Kate Sandra on K, K3D on my desktop, and so that's kind of like why you have that configuration where the Medusa is turned off because maybe if you're just doing dev work locally, you don't need backup and restore capability. Okay, so just don't you know turn that part off. Yeah, and I was I was doing some work just the other day where I didn't I didn't really need repairs locally either, so I turned that piece off just to slim down the amount of resources that were needed just for my development. Right, settings. and Alex Dejanovsky has a great post on the Kate Sandra IO site about like what is that uh, minimum development configuration because we know a lot of people like to run you know just the essentials locally, so definitely look for that that post on the on the uh, blog on KateSandra.io for that minimum config. It, there's this fascinating conversation around: Do we go with a single single node, or do I run multiple nodes in my development environment? And that way, you can simulate what happens when uh, two pods go down, and maybe you have a reduced consistency level. Yeah. Um, What's I, your recommendation? Personally, I like to just keep things really uh, minimal on my local machine. So as I 
wrap up features or as I do my testing, I'll, I'll run against mm -hmm. a cluster with, with multiple nodes because I do like to test those failure scenarios. Uh, but I also am cognizant of, uh, depending on the size of the data, maybe a single node is, is sufficient. Right. Um, this, this is kind of related to, I don't want to derail you too much, sorry, Chris, but uh, there's, a, there's a pertinent question from Eric Rodriguez here. What are the hardware and storage type considerations, if any, for running Cassandra? In other words, like what instance type and backing storage do you want to use in your various public clouds? I'm paraphrasing the end of the question there to broaden it a little bit. Sure, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's interesting. We just use a storage class. Uh, to to provision our storage. So here I'm using the local path because well that's what comes with with Rancher and it's or with K3D. It's from Rancher and it's pretty easy to use. But if I was going to deploy into GKE, um, I, I may use something like a PDSSD. If I'm if I'm looking at EKS, I'd, I'd be looking at like Elastic Block Storage. Um, one of the nice things about Cassandra is it does a lot of the shuffling of the data for you. So you can, uh, for instance, leverage those ephemeral volumes, which are super fast. Uh, but right. the downside is. But <laughs> Yeah, they're pinned to the server, right? And so if, if a Kubernetes worker goes down, what happens to that data? Well, you have no guarantee that it's coming back. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the, the operators in Kate Sandra is, well, if you're moved to a new Kubernetes worker, uh, we actually are aware that you're using uh, a volume that can move or, or not. And if it comes up and it says, oh, this volume's empty, well, then we'll reboot strap with from off the other nodes in the cluster. Now, let's say you're using something like EBS where the data can follow that pod to another worker. Uh, well, that'll happen and then we won't have to do that bootstrap, that, that full bootstrap process. We'll just bootstrap with the data that we already have uh, and, and rejoin the ring. So it's, it's a great question. I think it's highly dependent on your use case. You're super latency sensitive. I'd be looking at ephemeral volumes. Um, if you have a little bit more flexibility and want the, I would call a, a more available story, it's misleading. We're not. It's not that we're not highly available using local volumes. It's just the rescheduling and spinning back up where we move a volume is a lot faster than rehydrating like an entire terabyte of, of data off of existing replicas. And uh, to peel back the covers just a little bit, we are working on more extensive documentation and recommended deployment options per cloud, AWS, GKE, uh, yes. Azure. Right, so there, there will be more coming in that area with even more specific guidance. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and I expect to see a number of blog posts in that area too. So like, like we saw before with the Cassandra Data Center, um, from a storage perspe perspective, you just specify the storage class and then the size of the volume, uh, it's right here. So we're asking for read-write once, the local path provisioner. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a cloud provider, they may already have a storage class name or you can create a storage class with the name of their provisioner. Again, it's highly dependent on the cloud that you're using or if you're on-prem. Okay, so I'm going to take a look real quick. I'd like to show, we talked a little bit about Stargate. And I, I, it would, I think we should see if we have a second to just show what that looks like. So here, yeah. I'm just going to forward Stargate um, using kubectl. Go over here to Got all the APIs exposed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, just a single command would be nice, <laughs> right? And so we're going to copy our password. Uh, for the Kate Sandra super user. So we're just going to look at that, copy. If I go back here to Postman, um, the first thing that we do is we authenticate with a, uh, to retrieve a token. Let me make this just a little bit bigger. There we go. So we send yeah. this and it comes back. It gave us an auth token. I've taken the liberty of, of stashing it here inside of an environment variable so it's easier to use. Um, but from here, so I'm using the document API. So document API has a flexible schema. You can just kind of send it whatever JSON you want and it'll work. So here we can see these are all the namespaces that exist. Um, but I don't have one for my application yet. So we'll go ahead and create one. Um, so here we're going to say create a new namespace named my app. It created the namespace. And then if I go back and I read that namespace, we'll see it exists. The next thing that I'd, I'd like to do is, is create, um, in this example, I'm talking about surveys. Let's create a survey. And also say, oh, there's no survey table. You can see the URL is namespaces, my namespace name, mm -hmm. my collection. Here, I'm going to create a survey. And in this case, it's just a title and an array of questions that's empty. And this comes back with the document ID. This one takes a little bit longer because it's actually creating the tables in the background. It said it didn't have tables before. Now it does. And so here, we can see the document ID. If we go back and list out we can see this is that first document I've, I've submitted. Uh, same thing happens if I want to create a new 
uh, a new uh, collection, in this case, questions. Uh, I'm submitting, uh, what is your favorite color? And I've, I've just, I'm using environment variables here to keep the IDs in place. So now I have a new document ID. I can actually update my existing uh, document with that new ID. You might be saying, Chris, this doesn't, why, why don't you just have <laughs> like nested documents inside of here? That's a fair question. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm talking about it in this kind of context is that I like to play around with my data model here with the document API and then start to turn that into more concrete uh, tables that yeah. I would use with regular REST API or even with CQL. And uh, you know, for those that might be less familiar with Cassandra, this is, or, or even those that are, right? Not what <laughs> Cassandra interactions have looked like historically. Um, <clears throat> it's not a... I'm just going to experiment and play around with a data model and try some different document formats. That's not how things have worked historically. So this, uh, this document API that, that Stargate provides is a bit of a game changer that really kind of changes the developer experience for working with Cassandra. So like what you just saw is <laughs> something that five years ago would have been like, you did not just what? <laughs> Yeah, I like that I can just start adding fields willy nilly and not having to like go into CQL and say alter table and add my columns and think, well, do I need to add this as part of the key and all, all that stuff. Right. Um, so I think this is uh, this is a great point. I'd love to go into a bit more, but I think this is a really good time to transition into talking about questions that have come in. Oh, so yeah, we should. We should. Um, let me just tackle this because thinking about it, I, I started writing an answer to it. Uh, and then I was like, wow, this is too long to type. So. Um, Sharabesh is asking, so our enterprise is using Oracle um, and we're ready to move most of our apps to Kubernetes clusters, but how do we present Cassandra as a good option for cloud native apps? So I, this, there's multiple levels on which to answer this question. Um, so let's think about it in terms of uh, developer experience. So one is what is the skill sets that your application developers have versus what do you want them to have? Um, if they are prepared to learn CQL, um, great. In a lot of cases, that might not be what they want to spend their time doing. It all depends on the needs, right? So um, having something where you have, have flexible APIs like provided by Stargate, that's a good developer experience story. Um, another story you might want to look at is the cost story. So the cost of operating this system, um, are, are you able to tune and provision the resources to exactly what you need, not only for peak, but can you also have an elastic system that scales back down? Um, and uh, you know, so that there's those considerations as well. There's, there's also operational cost of how much labor do you have to invest? Um, there's a lot of maturation in, in this Kubernetes world for a lot of different databases. There are a lot of different operators out there. Um, especially on the relational side, it's almost like a wealth of choices. And you have the interesting problem of having to evaluate multiple different operators and pick which one you're going to use. Um, in the Cassandra world right now, there's a, a smaller set of those, but we've been working with this CAS operator project to kind of take the best of all of the, the existing Cassandra operators and kind of bake that into kind of one operator that, that the community is really rallying around. So. Those are the two main ways I would look at it is from the, the developer skill side and then the operational cost side. I hope that's helpful. Uh, and then also I would just say, you need to you know experiment and try this out for yourself and um, give us the feedback. Uh, you probably heard that we don't have everything answered yet. Um, this is very much like an emerging area that we're putting a lot of work into and a lot of collaboration and a lot of input is required. So we. Uh, we love getting the feedback about what works and what doesn't and, and the questions that you have. The questions that you're asking are honestly gold. Do you want to tackle one, Chris? Yeah, so uh, Edward has a question. All the Cassandra features are free to use or the full version is paid. This is an open source project. You can download it, you can run it. There are no licenses involved. Oh, there's the Apache software license, but that's that's what the code is distributed under. Uh, so uh, there's there's no issues there. If you're looking for support, there are some, uh, there's self-service support through the repos. There's also paid support through uh, Data Access Luna offering, um, but uh, there, there's no, uh, there's nothing stopping you from running this today. Yeah. 
Do you want to t um, take this next one to you about if, we, if you already have a cluster running with CAS operator, how do you just integrate the rest of the key standard elements kind of on top of that in place? You could do that, right? So we're, we're putting together the documentation on this. It's, there are some assumptions that are made with that Kate Sander, it, it plugs into the, the uh, existing uh, CAS DC or into it, the CAS DC. Uh, I want to make sure I understand the full implications of what that would do to an existing CAS DC. The seamless way that I would pursue is I'd, I'd set up a new data center with Kate Sandra and have it connect to your existing data center that's being managed purely by CAS operator. Um, then you can have it migrate the data into it and spin down the old DC after you perform the migration. Um, it's 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 zero yeah. downtime. Uh, it's 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 pretty painless. We have some documentation coming out about this here uh, in in the coming weeks. Uh, but the rest of the we have been looking into that. Uh, that like kind of we would love to the specific details of this use case. So please reach out to us. Uh, the community page uh, on the Kate Sand on the Kate Sandra.io site lists out various ways that you can get in contact with us. Probably the best way right now is our mailing list. But of course, file in uh, on the on the GitHub repo is also fine. Uh, maybe not if you just have a question. Like if you have a specific issue on an issue, and then we are working toward launching forums so we can have a more responsive uh, turnaround on your question. Also, see the answers to that's coming live very soon. Yeah. So there's another question of how can I add these dashboards to an existing Grafana? So with Kate Sandra, we have a flag that if you don't want to deploy the full Kube Prometheus stack, you just want us to, to provision the dashboards. We'll create those in a config map, and then you can wire those into your existing Grafana installation. Um, should you have a, a, a type of installation that doesn't support that kind of deployment of dashboards, uh, we have links to those in the project. Um, they're coming from the metrics collector for Apache Cassandra project. That uh, uh, So that, that, that's also available. So if, if you can't use the config maps, we also just have the JSON files and URLs that you can put in I'm fairly certain the Grafana. Uh, pod supports downloading dashboards for URL as well. So there's there's a couple of ways you can bring these into your existing Grafana environment. There's a question here, Jeff, uh, about the performance. If we're putting in additional layer of abstractions, I, I think the the uh, the person Robert is referring to uh, Stargate between your clients and the data nodes and. I know traditionally we would say, hey, just point your clients directly to Cassandra cluster. Maybe it'll skip an extra hop or it knows directly about which nodes to go to. Um, do you have any any feedback around that, that performance question? Um, well, I think it's it it really is going to depend on the deployment that you choose. I mean, one of the things that we're we are doing here is that Stargate nodes are deployed very close to. Uh, the Cassandra nodes. So that is going to cut down kind of on your network hop latency. Um, I think you have to consider the, there's def definitely some trade-offs here. So, you know, one of the things that Stargate nodes are really doing is uh, providing a layer that, that uh, can help you scale out reads a little bit better and, and uh, take some of that traffic that's off of the core Cassandra nodes that maybe uh, can focus a little bit more on handling the right load. So, um, it's, it's, it's sort of like a matter of um, how do you configure this and what's your ratio of starting nodes to um, old school Cassandra nodes. Um, we, one of the things that we're working on is a, a blog about how you kind of run your own performance tests using something called NoSQL Bench and another open source um, tool that, that uh, we've been working with. Um, so look for more content on how you do that here in the near future. There is a, a question here about uh, in the architecture we're showing both GraphQL and SQL. Do we need both of them? No, it that's that's there so you can choose the language that you want to use. Whether you want to communicate with GraphQL or just simple REST calls or the document database like we we, we showed. There's also the native protocol. It's really about flexibility. So um, if you have no need for the GraphQL endpoint, well, you, you, you just don't call it, uh, and and it's it's not an issue. Uh, but there are some architectures that like the GraphQL interface. And when you start looking at things like federation for GraphQL, uh, it gets pretty mm. interesting as you you can then query across multiple data stores. That's a whole another webinar. It is. We're running out of time. So I wonder if we might just kind of put up some of our uh, 
last wow. little promos and contact info here. And we'll try to get to the questions that we didn't get, get to and work on, on figuring out how to follow up with that. Uh, we Definitely. are um, doing a workshop at KubeCon Europe. I mean, that's less than a month away now. Man, that's coming up fast. Um, myself and Alex Vlachnev, uh, who's a, a fantastic developer <laughs> advocate and leads a great workshop. Um, so I'm excited to do that with him. Uh, free workshop, and that's on May 4th. I think Audrey just shared out the, the URL if, you, if you're interested in registering for that. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Jeff. Christina, do you want to take us out? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much to Chris and Jeff for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.